housing authority as part of the city. Um, so they, as part of the housing authority retreat, I think set the goal of six affordable housing units in the next four years, projects, not units. I call units as multiple, but six, six affordable um, housing projects within the next, was it three years? Three years, and so obviously that you're gonna need a, a significant capital um, investment in that to accomplish it. The other thing that we talked to the uh, council about is looking at the safe harbor areas and the qualified census tracts and utilizing the money to uh, really work with uh, the neighborhoods and the qualified census tracts to really create more sustainable uh, and resilient neighborhoods, um, tying into some of the plans that um, we've worked. Another component of that was early childhood education um, as being part of this. Um, we we're looking at ARPA funds versus CV funds that we have from CDBG and general fund. And so one of the recommendations we made to council in this budget process was to put a half a million dollars into early childhood education. And so um, thus far, the council said to move forward with that. So that'll be in the budget. And what was the other one, Karen? I know I'm missing one category. The whole neighborhoods. Household assistance and individual assistance. And what we talked to the council about is we really think that's one of the areas um, that is probably ripe for partnership because you all are already doing that. And um, obviously you got more money than we did. Um, and, and so um, how we use that to help individuals and households that are still reeling from the pandemic and how we can work together because you already have many of those project, many of those programs and administer, you have it set up where you're administering it. And I think that's a really good area for more discussions and partnerships. And so that's from a staff perspective. Uh, oh, business assistance is the other piece, sorry. Uh, but that's from a staff perspective. We still have to bring that back to the council for um, defining. And I think when we look at business assistance, where it's it's sort of hanging for us, is the, the whole duplication of benefit component in this and the fact that if they got a, a PPP loan or they used any other federal funds then they may not qualify for this. And um, that's for Peter, who is our federal um, fund um, expert to kind of work through all of those issues. And so that's from a staff perspective. I don't know if the council has anything they wanna to add to that. Um, when you mentioned uh, early assistance to early childhood um, education, and, and right now I think it's getting daycare back on its feet is, is probably the first order of business. Um, what I would like to ask is when making that, the decision that you did or the recommendation that you, you did about how much to allocate to that in specific, um, do you have data about how many families that uh, could be sending a member to the workforce that are not, um, that that would pull back into the workforce, roughly? So part of what we've talked about, and we've talked to the county group on this, is I think about 150,000 is actually for data collection so that we can start getting that information. Because I think generally we have some high level data but we don't have what we need to determine really what is the need, um, what different categories do folks sit in. And so um, we, county may not know this. We partnered with What Works Cities, which was funded by the Bloomberg Institute. And they came in and it was about data informed decision making. And so they're part of this conversation so that we can really refine the data and bring more detailed information to council, which will then feed other conversations and what we really need to put into it because it was hard to say, at least from an administrative point of view, what's the number? Because there was just so much uncertainty in the data.
So I really appreciate you, Polly, raising that issue of children and child well-being and, um, you know, the housing, poverty, uh, you know, the connection there um, and, uh, and the long-term effects of poverty on the whole trajectory of a kid. And there's a lot of data about the benefit of early intervention and quality early childhood education, but also the effect of toxic stress on kids when their parents um, are, are dealing with economic um, uh, insecurity and how kids absorb that. And it affects their executive function. So that's something that has always been very important to me. And I think embedded in this issue is um, is uh, mental health. Um, we saw statistics, I can't cite them to you, but the spike in emergency room visits for um, suicide, uh, suicidal ideation and suicide attempts for children was just heartbreaking. So, um, you know, we, through this process that, that Marta is leading, um, are collecting um, feedback and you know we just know from the comments that have been coming into the commissioners that um, mental health services are going to be real high up there. I think the trick here and then I'm, I'll put this hand it over to Marta um, is to go from identifying the problem <laughs> to identifying the solution and we don't need to tell you this, you're under the same uh, limitations as we are. We have to get this money, not just you know allocated or identified or earmarked, we have to get it spent. 
And so, you know, we want to do that wisely. You want to do that wisely. Um, and it's, I've just always found it's far more easy to identify the problem than to really identify those evidence-based programs that will address that problem. Do we want to, <clears throat> do we want to drill down on the early childhood issue right now? It kind of where that's where we were. I, I, I don't want to go further with that if, if you, if we want to go somewhere else. I just had one more ARPA question, if that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Early childhood until the fifth agenda item. All right. We're trying to do about fifteen minutes for each of these, and then it will we'll get it all done. All right. They, all Thank right. you for the bill. I I was just as a curiosity, because we're talking about this right now is the timeline, and I didn't hear you speak to that. And it sounded like those are staff recommendations is what you were sharing. So there's a whole process, I'm sure, and and we're going through that too. But I didn't know if you started thinking about a timeline yet, and I'm in the hopes that um, our report that will be done at the end of October can inform from a community perspective, we would love to at least offer that as a resource, as, as I've shared in our mayor's meetings um, with a lot of you and in the consortium as well. So just want to make sure that you all are aware of that part of the timeline and maybe that could be helpful. Yeah, yeah, we are because um, Peter was talking to us and I think the outside date is 2026. Is that correct, Sandy? And so when you saw the the, the the uh, six projects in three years was predicated on really having um, the last one out the door in construction with enough time to spin down and actually meet that timeline. And one of the things that I failed to mention is I failed to mention broadband because broadband is in there, especially digital divide. It's a little bit different for us because we already have it in place. And so we're looking at how we fill gaps. Um, and then what we did talk to council about is that these are one time dollars. So trying not to bring in ongoing expenses because of the one-time dollars and then creating a different issue down the road. And that was the other thing we talked about with them. I, I had something I wanted to add, and I'm glad that um, Claire, Commissioner Levy mentioned this around mental health. And that's, you know, that's one of a, a huge factor that we are seeing with our, our students, with our families. And... Um, especially during this um, COVID crisis. It's been ongoing, but I think through the pandemic, it has exacerbated and it, it really brought to light a, an issue that has been a problem for quite some time. And so one of the things, and I was grateful for Karen, um, but her, her name tags turned around. I think she knows who she is. <laughs> But there you go. So yeah, Karen, um, sitting in on one of the quarterly meetings for uh, mental health partners. And one of the things that we discussed was the, the turnover, the high turnover and being able, the inability to um, hire and retain therapists. So that inconsistency um, within the program, it, it's really, it's it, within the organization, it's really difficult for patients to have that sense of um, consistency and connection with, with therapists. I know that it isn't ongoing funds, but it, as, we're, as we're looking to put money into certain areas, you know, I, I would really, I would like to see money put in towards mental health, getting us through this pandemic. I mean, I think we're all in crisis and we're, we're in crisis mode, um, I was just telling. Council Member Peck, that I think last year was difficult teaching. This year is is worse. And I, in the 28 years that I've been in the profession, this is the single most difficult, challenging year that I've ever had. And and that's me. I'm thinking I'm able to juggle many things. I you know I have a son with autism. I'm I'm I have a lot of resilience. I'm thinking of people who early career teachers. Um, people who are experiencing other traumas going on at home as well and dealing with loss, um, it's, it's unmanageable. And so, you know, I can tie in what we're experiencing in the um, education field and tie it into, you know, what our, our healthcare workers and our mental health um, psychiatrists and therapists are dealing with. And if there is something that we can be thinking about as we're looking to allocate funds to help address some of those issues as well. Um, so that, that's my two cents. 
I'll give it to you. Sit. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask, I think, about the, both the commission and the city manager, um, whether on the front, on the spending front, whether there's been any thought given to some form of bootstrap spending, because it's one thing to answer the to ask the question, um, you know, how much should you allocate to this or that program, and say we need to study it and get more data, but the need for doing things like getting daycare back up and running is immediate. We aren't going to be on the road to recovery until those problems are solved. So it's just a question. And um, I'm handing the microphone to Joan because she and I were waving at the same time, but I hope we can answer the question. Thank you. So um, I think all of the issues have been uh, addressed and they kind of all roll into the same thing, but it is the mental health and anybody who knows me will know that I've been on this subject for six years. Um, mental health affects uh, everything and, and we do have an option next week in our budget process to decide where we want to use a half of our uh, marijuana tax uh, on mental health. But what we need from my perspective, and I know that uh, the previous co commissioners have heard this, is um, from my perspective is a facility. So when we're talking about hardcore dollars spent for sustainability, not Band-Aid, type issues, but things that we can carry on after the, the funds are gone. I think that what we need is a one-stop shop facility where our mental health partners, our uh, alcohol, um, shoot, what's it called? Recovery cafe for addiction, where uh, we can have um, hope and the hour center and people who are experiencing homelessness have a place to go instead of roaming around the city looking for different in, different uh, social things to help them. We have all of these things in our city, but a person who's experiencing homelessness or depression or mental health, they have to find these places. There's one on Kaufman, there's one on uh, over on Martin Street. There's what I really would like to see our hardcore dollars into a facility where we can actually help people. Um, and this is a larger discussion, but I think that would be something that is sustainable that we can use in the future. And it isn't just a Band-Aid, it is moving forward. I was just going to answer her question when you're So yes, because not all of it is for the data analysis, and so I think there is room within the half a million. We also have, we can look at our CDBG funds, and then as we look at the funds in general, um, on the ARPA, we have capacity, and then on the mental health side, again, I haven't been briefed yet. Karen just told me there is mental health work in some of the projects that they're submitting, so I just wanted to answer the, yeah. <laughs> I 
don't know. Okay, regional transportation. As you all know, we have the uh, 119 BRT that is in progress, and we are uh, doing our uh, first and main transit station. But I also want you to be aware of the opportunity for rail. And um, I don't know what funding that ARPA or the county needs to put into that, if anything. But I would like, I would like that to be at the top of your list of uh, transportation. We need, uh, we need facilities. We need um, stations, uh, whatever. I just want that to be at the top that we are. We do have two regional transportation options coming with BRT one 119 and the Northwest Corridor uh, as an alignment to the um, I-25 rail through Amtrak. I just want to thank you, Claire, for that. And I also am going to apply to be uh, one of the Dr. Cog appointees for that board. So thank you. Uh, 
didn't put it on paper for specific. He never emailed me back. He always called me back. Mm -hmm. uh, RTD has got a way of growing things. Um, but if you talk to your um, representative, or either representative of Boulder County on RTD, please ask them to keep pushing on this issue. Uh, we know our constituents want it. Uh, we hear it all the time. And that's just important that they're there. But they need us to keep uh, reinforcing it. And then the bus routes, I mean, people who have lesser means really got hurt by this. Uh, and uh, it's just bad. And remember, that's the point six tax, and the fast tracks, the train is the point four tax. So they're two different things we're talking about. But we just need to keep the uh, lobbying going uh, to make that a reality. And uh, I'll just leave it at that. Anybody else want to talk about that? Right. Some of these subjects go faster than others. I don't want to say anything more, but I think this topic was one that was suggested by Lawton and uh, and the phrasing of it. So I wondered if you had anything else in mind here in terms of regional transportation planning, other than what we've already talked about. You're talking about the highway to the No, well, the option for the plan. I thought that was a long time talk. Claire, I think it was when we first were going to have this meeting, uh, when it was scheduled at first, and the discussion about the Front Range Passenger Rail and Amtrak wasn't really a reality at that time. Yeah, just wanted to make sure we covered it. <clears throat> just before you pass the bike. Okay. Claire, could you? Claire, could you talk, do you have any more information to share about what the timelines might be for uh, fleshing out the board or filling out the board for the Front Rail Passenger District? Review for us the counties that are involved, and what are the steps that you anticipate as we talk about options that you would anticipate that we all should be aware of, right? What, what are the thresholds we have to pass to go from a piece of legislation to an option, right, that's actionable? Um, thanks, Jim. So, the, so the, the governor's appointment, there are uh, deadlines in the bill for those appointments, and I believe um, the governor has to nominate his six uh, slots mid-March 2022, I believe. Um, those, he is doing that through the mutual board's commission's nomination process. And so if you go to the website where they have all the board commissions and you put your name in. Um, the, the, so I know Dr. Cog is going to do it through their nominations process. And, um, and I believe all of them have to be confirmed by the Senate. I'm, I'm not certain whether it's just the, the governor's appointments. So, so that board will be seated, and then it will become a special district uh, and governed by the provisions of Senate Bill 238 and the rest of the Special District Act, Title 32. So all the regular provisions in Title 32, unless they're superseded by the Act, are going to, are going to govern. Um, and it does have authority to impose a sales tax and or, well, it's got authority for both, at the war on and sales tax. And it would be up to the district, the board, to decide um, what to put on the ballot. Um, if there are some requirements in the bill to uh, produce a detailed financial analysis um, before voting to the voters uh, for a tax, um, there's, um, uh, what you're trying to think. Well, there, there were some provisions in there that, that Boulder County partnered up with the City of Boulder and some other entities. I don't think Longmont was part of this to make sure, um, well, they're trying to weight it towards the Northwest Rail route because there are three routes that uh, have been under study. And, um, you know, to try to make sure that there are performance numbers that are required so that, because evidently the Northwest Rail route uh, performs the best for survivorship and cost. Um, 
I think I'm trying to think of some of the other conditions that were in the bill um, as, as um, requirements before they could, before the district could go to the voters for a tax. I don't there were a number of them in there. Um, and then there are additional provisions that allow a specific uh, station sub tax um, to do station area improvements. So within the half mile radius of the station. Additional special district um, that would be formed, and that would be formed through the the PID or LID process. Um, is that sort of what you want to form? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, I think I'll just say you know, one 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 thing I think we were really trying to be careful of as we were analyzing this bill was to try to get better representation that was proportionate to the population. So the bill is originally introduced. The whole of Dr. Paul, which is close to 2 million people, three board seats, and it gave Pikes Peak Cog, uh, which has, I think, about three quarters of a million. Um, they, that had two. The South Central, basically the Pueblo, Area had one, uh, it, so it was it was not not fair at all in terms of population distribution, and I, I think we did a pretty decent job of getting that redistributed. But another thing we were really trying to work hard on is to make sure that you know that we actually know what kind of federal commitment it, there's going to be um, before going to the voters, because you know there's there's a concern given you know what looked like disproportionate representation for the southern part of the state that's really interested in having a connection off with the south of the chief, that the resources would, would that all, from all the taxing uh, authority up here, all the money up here, would go down south and fund improvements down there. And so um, we put language in the bill that um, the area for the, the first uh, phase of improvements have to reflect the areas with the highest ridership and the highest um, you know, potential for um, uh, I think maybe mitigating uh, traffic or something like that. So we put some criteria in there to try to make sure that the, the North Front Range area, uh, where we have the greatest congestion, we generate the most greenhouse gas emissions, we need to vote for me. Um, so the, the subtext of this district is what the legislators wanted this to have. The Southwest Chief Chiefs they to do it. And from a big picture point of view, this is probably this is the biggest special district ever created by the legislature in terms of people who could be taxed. And so uh, the, the concerns that Claire was talking about are very real. Um, and as far as timing, that tax big milestone, and then the federal government will make a, talk about an X factor, but the concern of we get our fair share and we have federal money so that we don't tax people and don't get much, uh, we're trying to address more. Um, my concern is that we've been talking about public transportation and connecting color, all of Colorado from Kansas to Utah, from New Mexico to Wyoming, uh, since the 70s, and we haven't done it, and it's only gotten more and more expensive, and now it's prohibitively expensive in every single way. So now what we're doing is breaking it up into special districts, and we're already part of a special district, as we know, and Longmont has gotten less and less every year. Um, so uh, it's going to be a very hard to get people in Longmont to vote for yet another special tax district when we have seen our service cut and cut and cut. And now people talk about bus rapid transit. I was one of the first um, group of women to drive a bus in uh, Boulder in 1974 or something like that. Uh, and I can tell you there is no such thing as bus rapid transit. A system that is not discrete from the roads is never going to be any faster than any car. 
So although it may have less stops, it is still subject to all the same problems with car accidents, with weather conditions, with everything. So unless you have light rail or rail of some kind or something that is just that is separate from the road system, it's not going to be very good public transit. We could have that. And I was very excited about Governor Polos, who does seem to have a vision for what we can do. We can't keep paying for more and more and more roads. Even if they're electric vehicles, they're still going to be on the roads. And we can't keep, we have no way to finance it unless we change uh, something about the gas tax with electric vehicles getting to be more and more prevalent, which is a good thing. Um, so we really need to, it seems to me, advocate for transit systems, how, whatever means that is, that are their own discrete path. And um, every other country does this, and many places in this country do it. Colorado has problems because we don't have the mass of people to support this. But we really did have better transportation in the 70s than we do now. You could get on a bus and go to, to Meeker, Colorado. To do the same thing now, you would have to either go to Grand Junction and rent a car, or go to Steamboat Springs and rent a car. This is ridiculous that we're going backwards. So I, I would like to see us band together with uh, addressing this on a statewide basis. Because frankly, what we saw, what we've seen in the, uh, the RTD district is that only Denver has got this, despite the fact that we voted on something which was supposed to be evenly built out. It hasn't been. And the uh, meltdown of 2007 was used as an excuse for that, but they've never gone back. So I support, I, I think we need to support any efforts to make it better, but I really do think we need to be thinking more on a statewide basis and more in terms of light rail or um, um, something that is separate from the, the road system as our basic uh, connector and then buses off of that. Thank you. Um, I just kind of like to get the central issue about the new proposed special district out on the table. Um, because it is very large and there's a lot of people in it. Um, it could be that Boulder County will never vote for it. What happens if, if the district passes, but not in Boulder County? Right, so the, we could be voted into this district even if the pop public of Boulder County does not um, does not go along with it, I just wanted that to be on the record. Right, you're right. That's why we pay attention to it. We've been trying to do that, and also to keep the public from voting for it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Because it is the central issue. Yeah, and that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. 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 A little summary, we had a compost facility proposed. Uh, we withdrew that after pushback from our mayors. Uh, and we have since hired a person to help us figure out uh, composting solid waste solutions, not necessarily a facility, but ways to uh, improve uh, that issue in Boulder County, which is highly supportive. It does seem like some people. I would just like to say I don't like the characterization. It may have begun that way, but I don't like the characterization of this was something about people not wanting it to be near them. I think it's something about markets. Um, you know, with a composting facility, you have material that goes into the composting facility, and you have the material that comes 
out of the composting facility. And on both sides, the point of the whole thing is A, to reduce methane emissions from what uh, would uh, otherwise be compost <laughs> or what, what would otherwise be landfill waste, excuse me. Um, but then you have the carbon footprint associated with getting the input to the composting facility to the facility, and you have the carbon footprint of getting the resulting products of the composting facility, the compost, the tea, all of that stuff, um, to where it's going to be used. And I think the fundamental local objection to the first proposal was that there was no market for the products here in Boulder County. Uh, so I, I don't really like the idea of, of saying it was because people didn't want it nearby. It was because there was no market for it nearby. Is there, <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm, certain, I'm not certain what the take is from the, we heard a lot from the neighbors, um, and I'm certain that, that, that markets are an issue. What would be helpful to me, uh, we, we kind of, I, I was kind of surprised by the whole proposal, um, and I don't know what the disconnect was between our staff and, and your staff. Um, so it would be helpful for me to know if, if there, what's the level of discussion is there, is there momentum going forward? It's good to know you've hired somebody. Um, uh, is, that, is there gonna be a conversation into which we're invited or uh, you're gonna flesh out options and then kind of ask for reactions from municipalities? How will this unfold? Because we can't solve it ourselves. It's only gonna happen when we do it as a partnership. And, and, it, and we need to do it. I mean, that's there, we just can't get to the commercial aspects of this on our own. Um, and, and yet we need to get, we need to get there. So, you know, what are your thoughts about, uh, what's the time frame? Are there steps? What do you need from us, um, to move it in some direction? Thanks for that, that question. Um, I, two things. I want to make sure that we touch on a couple guys that we get in this number three. This is about zero waste. This is about the fact that we all live in a country and a county that wastes. And that really, I want to pull it back to that because it really isn't about specifically a, a compost facility or a neighbor or not a neighbor. It's really about how do voters who decided and residents who agree that we're wasteful and that we need to look at options about how we are going to be more efficient, more effective with uh, saving our in one little area. We could talk about climate and all those other pieces, but this is one of those responsibilities. So I just want to make sure that we don't get that piece of this conversation. And to your question about what's up next, what's gonna happen, and yes, we've hired somebody, um, I think some of those folks are excited about that opportunity to do community engagement, to go through a whole public process, and to set this conversation up, whether it's a partnership, whether it's smaller projects, so how do you incorporate partners administration, there's a lot of different pieces to it. So I just wanna make sure that one, that other piece of it really is the focus, and ensure you all, as well as folks that are watching, participating online, that there will be a public process. I believe that this board is really committed to ensuring that we do all of our work in, 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 in ways engaging the public. And I don't know if our county administrator wants to talk about it all, but I think it's, it's great that Dan is here with us this evening. I can't talk. <laughs> um, I, one key thing in what Mark said, said is that, that we are asking this new staff person to do is really look at whether it is a facility that we need. Um, facilities are hard to site and, um, and they're expensive and it does, you know, I think the previous project um, you know, kind of had, was driven by the thought that we need a facility and it needed to be in Mueller County. That there's something virtuous about, about taking care of our own waste. And that sounds very virtuous, but I don't know that there's, that 
composting in Boulder County is inherently any better than composting anywhere else, other than the, the um, greenhouse gas emissions, you know, drive and bear and like that. So there is that. But, you know, we need to just really open this conversation up. Maybe it's a series of smaller facilities. Maybe it's um, spending more time with, with the ag community in um, finding ways to actually do it directly on the site. So we just really have to open the conversation up and really want to hear your, the, the thoughts of long on uh, because if you are, you know, you are really important partners um, for us. But now I'll let the first two really know. Um, uh, I just wanted to add two things. First of all, I'll give you a name. Noah Eisenman is the person that we hired. Um, staff would be familiar with him. He works for the city of Boulder and so has some good global experience and is um, really a strategist around zero waste. In, in general, he will be the uh, staff person who works with the Resource Conservation Advisory Board. So Longmont has a member on that board, and a lot of these conversations about you know where are we going with zero waste, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's building, all of that um, will go through our parent as an advisory capacity. So I just wanted to make sure that. Um, that, that would, <laughs> um, I, uh, I was all for this uh, facility. I, I am I'm very sorry that it got derailed. I think it's really unfortunate that a small group of very wealthy people with a very savvy public relations person and a whole slew of lawyers were able to derail this. But um, I do think that there was a problem in that the previous city, uh, the previous commissioners did not really uh, alert some of the places. I know Erie was very upset and all kinds of things. But as for a market, I mean, every, every municipality around here needs mulch and very, this stuff for their work and gardeners need mulch. Uh, we have the, the footprint of driving it to somewhere in our stuff to somewhere in Boulder County as opposed to where we drive it now, which is far, far away. It is much smaller. It is makes perfect sense. And we do need a regional composting facility. And I, I hope we can arrange that because it is so much better and less expensive for everyone to do it this way. Um, and I, I certainly think there's just as much of a market here as there is currently, which is, you know, the, the facility we use is far, far away, but he manages to have a market for that. So I, I don't see that that's actually an issue, but I, I, I really do support us having one. In uh, Boulder County, it just makes sense for the future. If I could clarify, um, I have a whole folder full of letters from organic farmers <coughs> who said, I can't use that compost. I have a whole folder full of uh, letters from uh, organic backyard farmers who said, I can't produce, I can't use what that facility uh, would produce. They gave their reasons. And so I'm not saying we shouldn't have a regional facility. Maybe we should and maybe we shouldn't. But we should have a regional facility where the produced compost will be uh, an acceptable product to our local people. And I um, don't think we can overlook that. Um, all compost is not the same. All green activity is not the same. And... Uh, just because people have good lawyers doesn't mean they're wrong.
<laughs> I bet this could have been the entire topic for an hour. Um, and your mom and I just invite us to look at some of the things. We can only talk for a long time, but it's exciting. We can talk about it this year. I've been working on this. The public mouse will go out to the future. So participate in how we can do this. When I'm inviting the students from Jetta, So thank you for that. I, I really believe that we need to be looking at it. It's not going to be one solution. There's going to be many. And just for concentrating on one, one piece is not going to solve the problem. And I really appreciate that you brought in these, these other 
from creative approaches. So that, that is definitely something I want to take a deeper look into on top of you know, continuing what we're doing to increase our stock, to increase um, higher density, um, and, and a myriad of options for, um, for folks to be able to, to buy, it, buy a home, whether it be a condo, whether it be a single family home, um, but you know, definitely continuing that, um, what we're doing, but also um, looking at other options as well. So yeah, I am interested in knowing more about that. So, you know, one casualty of COVID has been really to know a house in Colombia, which has been a very nice fan. You know, the house rate in Colombia is really a new online revenue source in conjunction with transportation. So, it's a standalone. This is not going Try this one. Um, so yeah, I broke the mic. Um, whether to whether to uh, revisit the idea of a countywide revenue source for housing, and um, you know we are going to be going out with a poll. Um, I, I've been hearing um, soon. I've been hearing that for uh, about six months, but I think it's going to be soon to just try to test the waters on what how people are feeling here post COVID or we're not post COVID. We thought we would be, but are, you know, are people feeling still uncertain enough about the economy that they wouldn't be supportive of new revenue sources for any number of things and housing and transportation is going to be part of that. But, um, you know, when we talk about uh, solving the housing problem or at least addressing it, we really do want to have housing in every community, affordable housing in every community. But barring that, and because sometimes, you know, we do have just a mismatch of jobs and housing and, you know, with two income families, maybe one person gets to live close to their job, but the other person doesn't. There, we have a problem here with the cost of transportation and housing and the drive till you qualify might mean that you have an affordable mortgage, but your transportation costs coupled with your mortgage are now unaffordable and you are dependent forevermore on a, you know, a, a working car. And so all the more reason to try to locate housing in the community in which people work. But I think we also, it comes back to that transportation issue and having better um, multimodal transportation options so that if people don't live in the community in which they work for whatever reason, choice, maybe it's not affordability, that they have affordable transportation options as well. So I, we, you know, we do have to think about those two issues as being linked. Uh, Claire, I'm glad you mentioned transportation because uh, Councilwoman Peck and I, and uh, the former mayor, toured the uh, transportation oriented housing down in Denver, which is really interesting because I, I think we all know that it costs a nine to 12 more thousand dollars a year to have a car. And if then you're, you're only making $20,000 a year, <laughs> uh, there's nowhere you can live. Um, and so if you can have something that is on a, tra on a transportation line, uh, you have much more of a chance of doing something. But um, I, I really think one thing that we need to prioritize in the country, and certainly in Boulder County, is home ownership, because that is the only way we can to um, get out of a cycle of poverty. You know, we lost at least well, approximately 10%, I think. I'm sure Martin <laughs> knows about this and Aaron knows about this better than I do. But during the, the last giant meltdown of <laughs> 2007 and 8, um, we lost about, oh, close to 10% of home ownership. And it hasn't really come back. In fact, it's getting worse and worse. So we have to find ways to increase home ownership for the stability of of every community 
if a child, for instance, going back to kids, uh, has to move every three years or every year when the landlord jacks up the rent, then um, that's no life for a child. It's, it's very disorienting and that family is going to be living in poverty or constantly stressed out financially. So not everybody will, will always have plenty of renters, but we used to be a nation where everybody or most people aspired to having on owning a home and um, people seem to be giving up on that in despair and that's a that's a very bad sign for our community so i think if we can explore things like land banks uh, land trusts cooperatives which uh, are difficult but better than not owning anything because intergenerational wealth particularly for people who have been traditionally marginalized by everything is critical to uh, actually having a stake in your life no. anybody else I get really stoked seeing the uh, spoke on Coffin Street going up. That, I, that's so great. Every time I come drive up to Longmont, I look around and it's just like, wow, it's happening. So um, thanks for your work and with us on doing that one. Um, and bit by bit, that helps, right? So, but let's get to um, early childhood education. And then I'll do a call for public input. Uh, I don't see many folks, but I'll do it anyway. So if anybody wants to kick us off, please do. I'll just start. We, um, it's, it's, this has been a priority for this council for several years. Uh, and uh, Marta and Claire were both with us, what, 10 days ago or so, uh, when the governor came and spoke, <clears throat> uh, both to promote what he's done with his initiative in the, the early childhood office. Um, but to also reinforce where we are as a community, working in partnership with the Early Childhood Council of Boulder County. Um, we have an action plan. The data, the, the, the investment that Harold talked about earlier, uh, hopefully a year from now, <clears throat> we, we can answer the question of how many parents and how many kids are unserved, uh, what the needs of our employers are, right, in terms of uh, their employees, because uh, the problem is not just a Longmont problem. You know this better than we do. It's a regional problem. It's at least a county problem. Uh, the Longmonters who work in, you know, other parts of the county or, you know, those folks who work here at every, all of them with, with children, especially if they're um, preschool age kids. So for us, <clears throat> it's, it's not just early child education, it's child care right through that continuum to the time kids are in school and then the needs of kids, school age kids, you know, when they're, when mom and dad aren't around and, and, and uh, kids need supervision. We asked folks <clears throat> in the event that we hosted 10 days ago to reimagine a, a whole industry. Uh, and as we started this conversation talking about the best and highest use of ARPA funds, certainly this is gonna be part of it. But, but it would be a mistake to think that's gonna solve a problem. Uh, the, the, the needs are so, the, the system we, we, we lack a system. We need a system, not unlike the K-12 system, right? Where it's funded on a stable, uh, ongoing basis, where, they, where, where, the, where the work is, the employees are professionalized. Uh, uh, how much of that can be at a county or local level? In our plan, we've got some options that we think would, would help satisfy, or meet state, state standards for the preparation and the credentialing of employees without getting caught up in some of the regulatory disincentives that occur at the state level. But at the end of the day, this conversation that's unfolding here, I know it, well, I don't know. I believe at some point it's gonna end up on your agenda because we're gonna talk about solving this on a countywide basis. Maybe it's, on the, maybe it's on the desks of the school boards at Boulder Valley and St. Brain Valley School District. But I suspect more likely it's gonna be something where there's a group gonna to come to you to say, we, we, this only gets solved. I know this was something that was presented to Larimer County, Larimer County commissioners in the fall and, and they passed on putting something on the ballot. But I can just tell you that's an active conversation. 
And um, it's going to be really helpful sooner than rather than later to get some idea where where you are, how you think about both the, the nature, the scale of the problem, and, and the options for solving it from your perspectives on a countywide basis. Tim, thanks for that. I wondered if you had any updates. Originally, when I was working on that committee with y'all, it, it, the invitation was about a special district and potentially countywide. And just curious if that's still in the conversations as a solution to get to the early childhood funding because it's changed some. Yeah. It's gotten more significant and the need's gotten yeah. more dramatic. Yeah, we had Marta early on was one of our troops uh, showing up every week. Um, and one of our working groups was we really organized, organized around a question, special district, yes or no. I mean, there was we never answered that question. There is no conclusion to that uh, on, a, on a range of options or continua uh, continuum, right? That's somewhere along a continuum with other possibilities. We know, we know counties, counties have create, have, have, uh, successfully proposed dedicated sales tax or property tax. I'm, I'm not certain in, in Summit County or, you know, Gilpin County, what, what those counties that have done that. Uh, I know what was proposed in, uh, what was going to be proposed in Larimer County, uh, was, um, uh, I think it was actually, I think it was a county initiative as opposed to a special district. Um, I'm not surprised the commissioners passed on it just based on how I understood it to be organized and how money was going to be distributed. But, but there's something to learn from that experience, what they proposed and, you know, how that was analyzed by those commissioners. Um, and I don't know, Marta, what, what ultimately a proposal is going to look like. You know, it's going to be, everybody understands you've got all kinds of things potentially that you've got to consider putting on ballots or not. Um, but I do know this, this, we won't solve this problem with one-time funding, no matter how much money it is. Yeah. And we, and it won't, we won't recover fully from this pandemic unless we can stabilize a workforce. And we won't stabilize a workforce by dragging, dragging the pre-pandemic childcare system into the future. It's just not tenable. So I was, I was, I guess I was just going to say the obvious, really, which you you sort of said already, Tim. It's just the the problem can't be addressed without an infusion of public money. Um, you know, people complain, rightfully so, about the cost of uh, of childcare, particularly infant and toddler. But yet, our early childhood workforce is making poverty wages, sub poverty wages. And people wonder why is childcare so expensive when childcare workers are so poorly paid? It's because it's very labor intensive. You need a facility. You need constantly, you know, to renew um, your equipment. Um, you know, it, it's expensive, and the it, you can't. The only way you can solve that is public money. And you know, Denver has the the. Um, I, I think it's a mill levy. I don't think it's a sales tax for the Denver P preschool program. Um, so I think we're going to have to go that direction. I just don't think there's any way, um, not only for the workforce, and the workforce is really important, but for the well-being of kids. Uh, they need quality um, child care. They need to be taken care of by people um, who are committed to that profession and uh, and and not be able to form bonds and relationships and not have that high turnover. So, you know, we've there are so many needs, and every time we talk about the kinds of things that need to go on the ballot, childcare is one of them. And I, I guess it really is something to think about whether you know, with a special district that would be, you know, a subset of the county, and whether that's the way to do it whether to do it countywide, I don't think we know. Um, we would really love to continue this conversation and get your thoughts. The need is certainly there throughout the county. I don't think anybody would say we're, we're good. We don't need any more help. So we'll, we'll see where that goes. So um, I'm, I'm really proud that uh, Longmont has, this is one of its uh, visions um, for, in our work plan as, as what we want for our city and county. But when we discuss this, I don't want us to forget that childcare is not just in centers. 
It is also in homes for uh, infant through 18 months old, 18 month old. And I, and I do know that this is part of Governor Polis's uh, vision as well. So when we talk about the expense of childcare, it has to be equitable. Um, a lot of people do childcare in homes because of the cost and because of the consistency of the childcare provider from birth through kindergarten. Um, some people stay with the same childcare home for five years, whereas in a childcare center, the, the uh, teacher, whatever you want to call them, the, the caregiver changes depending upon who the shift, when they're employed, et cetera. And it is a choice of a parent as to how they want their child cared for. So when we discuss this, I don't want us to forget that part of it, that um, if there is a tax in some way, either through an initiative, through a special district, et cetera, it's going to have to really take the cost of ch child care to the lowest possible amount um, because that is where the stickler is at the end of the day for parents. So. Else. Was there anybody here for public comment? I see no one. Yeah. So uh, we'll close that part of the meeting and uh, continue on. Oh, okay. Well, um, I just want to make a comment on child care. Um, I think once again, uh, we are. This is a very, very strange time, but we are also extremely lucky to have a governor who not only is future thinking in terms of transportation, but also has been involved with daycare since he was born, literally. I worked for his parents who had a baby and then realized they didn't know what they were going to do with that baby all day. <laughs> and that, so they started asking their employees and their employees said, yeah, we've got the same problem. We don't, you know. And so they started a daycare in their building. And I have been trying for years to try to get businesses to understand that they could pool resources. I mean, their employees would be less stressed, would have more time, would be happier, and um, in every way things would be better if they would pool resources and, and create sort of little regional uh, child care centers, or if they have enough room, they could turn their you know, part of their office into childcare. Um, a lot of things have been done on a statewide basis. As uh, Councilwoman Peck said, it isn't just a matter of incentives and money. It is a matter of the fact that it is, it is a very difficult job. And um, people, uh, the daycare centers often make a lot of money, a lot of money. But the people working there who are almost exclusively women um, are paid extremely poorly. And they also have to keep up, um, uh, they have a lot of education they have to go through, a lot of hoops they have to go through. A lot of that has been changed um, by our terrific state legislators and the governor by helping people who are going through daycare education to get their uh, certificates in a more timely way and helping them with financial incentives. You can't have a daycare center without daycare workers. And so it is many different approaches like everything. It's not just a matter of taxing people and giving them, you know, having money available. It is also that you have to have daycare workers who will stay with them. Nobody wants to just weigh the warehouse their child. They want good care. That's you. I mean, the person taking care of your child is you in absentia. So you want them to care about your child and also educate your child. And that takes a very special person. Uh, so money can't buy that. But, you know, if you help people, good people, actually get their certification and you help small family uh, 
people who are educating people in their homes to um, do a little better and make it easier for them. They're, if you help out, for instance, we help provide masks and various things for daycare centers. If everybody helps these daycare centers a little bit, we can have a better situation for everybody. Um, so that's what I would like to see is an appreciation for what can be done on a statewide basis. We have already passed a whole lot of things in the last three years that make it much easier for daycare workers to actually be daycare workers. And that's a, a very important part of this. Just one more, one last comment. Um, uh, the, the data on the number of licensed providers is pretty clear. That, that number has been declining year over year. Uh, Polly's right, we're not gonna solve this, or Joan's right, we're not gonna solve this through licensed providers only. Um, <clears throat> but the, one of the interesting data points we heard from Larimer County, the, the, the Larimer County Council <clears throat> had offered 48, had made 48 job offers last year. Uh, they, they, made, they hired 48 people. 45 of them had already left in the first year. So you think just to be at the cost, I mean, you, you know, you understand this in terms of the cost of turnover, but that's a result of our failure to professionalize, compensate, support a, a, a whole industry and, and those people who we, we have tried to recruit to be part of it. So, um, I mean, that, that, that's just not sustainable. And obviously that's going to take money and that's going to take, uh, public money, I, I suspect, if we're going to, if we're going to reimagine and then respond to what we imagine in terms of a, a new era of child care. So we're going to finish at 730. That's about five minutes from now. Anybody want to talk about child care or any of these other topics that are on the bottom of the agenda? The hockey puck drop. Get your stick ready. Take a swing at it. Everybody wants to go home? Well, there are about three topics on the bottom that I'm interested in. Um, I just want to bring to your attention that uh, we have a, um, Boulder County has an opportunity to uh, possibly look at having an equestrian center at the Boulder County uh, fairgrounds. Um, and I would like that to be at some point in the future in 2022 to be a discussion that we open up with the commissioners to uh, see if there's a possibility or any interest in furthering that discussion. I brought that up six years ago. Um, so I, I just want to revisit it. Um, the other thing is safe lots for sleeper vehicles. We have a lot of people, uh, we have three safe lots for cars. And um, there are 33 people who are living in their cars right now that are waiting to be vetted to get into those safe lots. We have so many people who have been unhoused for various reasons. I would love it all to be COVID so we can throw a lot of money at it, but I don't know if that's true. Uh, that is a, something that we need to look into further. But we also have people living in their sleeper vehicles, be they vans, campers, uh, another type of uh, sleeper vehicle, because they have been unhoused, again, for various reasons. A lot of it because of COVID, because their uh, rent has gone up and some landlords or managers want back pay, their back rent from the rent they lost over the time that, the, that they were not paying rent. So we had asked at one point to use the camp lot at the fairgrounds because it does have a dumping station for people who live in their sleeper vehicles, but they are residents of our city. They are not transients. Um, and there are some uh, people living in those vehicles who have children who are going to school in the St. Green Valley School District. So I'd like to re-address uh, that issue um, as we look for housing for those people. We would like, or I personally would like to open up that conversation once again 
to see if we can temporarily use that camp lot at the fairgrounds or perhaps another lot and, and charge uh, dumping fees so that they wouldn't actually camp there, but perhaps could use the facilities. So, um, and then air quality. Air quality is bad, <laughs> as we all know. Um, that's the bigger uh, conversation. I would just like to push that out there that I think that the uh, county and cities need to have a joint conversation about how we can, I know we're discussing it with greenhouse gases and um, EVs and buses and trains and getting vehicles off, but how can we, how can we address it in other ways to bring our county uh, into the focus as being a solution, as looking for solutions. So that's it, those are my three issues. <laughs> I don't think, thank you. I don't think we're gonna be able to do justice to any of these topics at the bottom. We just don't have the time, but I think it's a great start. Yeah, thank you. And I wanna just respond to, especially for public, for the, I'm on the Master Plan Executive Advisory Board for the fairgrounds. And that public process has started with two weeks ago, that group put together meetings with all the current users of the fairgrounds. So just so that folks know that the public, then the open groups for community members who have new ideas, who maybe aren't users currently of the fairgrounds, the groups of our community around the entire county, because it is Boulder County Fairgrounds, folks in the mountains, some of our other um, sectors of communities who aren't currently using that facility for events, we are inviting those folks as well. And so there'll be a whole public process in addition to what's already started. So I just wanna make sure that folks know that and certainly for the public. Um, and if that's the ideas that they wanna bring in and others, we would be really, really interested in hearing all of this as that plan develops. And again, just a few options on preferences for the, for the next uh, meeting. I was very happy to see a barrier-free homeless shelters or lower barrier homeless shelters uh, on this agenda. I'm sorry we didn't get to talk about it, but I think it's an important thing uh, because there are just, there are, what it's doing is it's, it's increasing the service defiant segment of our unhoused pe persons because they're, asked, they're being asked to give up too much to get into navigation. Uh, and I, you know, regardless of whether it's constitutional, it's inhumane. Um, but I would like to ask the commission as a group, and maybe this can be the commission's closing remarks, um, how you feel about the ACLU's summer statement uh, about Boulder County's coordinated entry program. Okay, I should have thought of sending it to you beforehand. I'll send it to you afterwards and we'll talk about it at a later date. Sorry to blindside you. So this is just about 7.30. Um, it's about 7.30, so I think uh, we'll call it a night. So thank you everybody for doing this. It was a year off and now we're back and it's great to see everybody again. Thank you for being public servants. I think it's the highest calling, um, being raised by a couple of parent, by a couple of teachers. Um, so thanks for being part of this. Thanks for delivering service and look forward to working with you on these issues, including ARPA.